Welcome everyone to a webinar with Professor, is it Geha or? Jiha. Jiha, okay. Thank you. With Professor Jiha. So before we begin, we'll talk about what Scienceholic is. So Scienceholic is a youth run nonprofit that aims to introduce intricate scientific concepts in a manner that is fun and comprehensible to teens. So currently we have some positions that are open. As you know, Scientolic, our goal is to serve as a free resource for students to learn more about science topics. So if you're interested, you're welcome to join us and apply. Thank you very much. Okay, so some things about Professor Giha. She's a professor in astronomy and physics at Yale. She obtained a BS in applied and engineering physics from Cornell University and a PhD in astrophysics from University of California, Santa Cruz. So we'll start with a few questions. The attendees, if you have any questions, please write them down at the end of the webinar. We'll go through all the questions that you have. So first things first is academics. What is the focus of your academic and current career? Is pursuing astrophysics or physics a challenging subject? And how do you balance teaching whilst researching about the galaxy? Awesome. Thank you. So first, thank you guys so much for inviting me. Um, it's exciting to chat with you. I um, let's see. So um, I love my job, and what my job is is it is really balancing research and teaching. Although I do sometimes they're they're the same thing. Um, so my research is uh, focused on understanding how galaxies form, and using galaxies to understand sort of the underlying nature of the universe. So. What is dark matter? Um, uh, what are sort of the underlying physics equations of, um, of, of the universe? And so um, I use telescopes to get data. And a lot of what I do is actually computer programming. Um, so sort of day to day is, is a lot of computer programming. And so I'm actually, both of those are combined at the moment. The class that I'm teaching this semester is scientific computing and astrophysics. And so I'm sort of teaching some of the things that I do day to day, um, but it's definitely the balance is um, something that I learn every day and every year. And I'm sure when I'm 110 and still doing this, I will still be learning how to balance research and teaching, but I really love that I'm able to do both. Um, I wouldn't wanna be in a job where I just do research. I think I would get, um, sort of bogged down in the details somewhat. And I wouldn't want to just do teaching because I really do love the research aspect of, of, of what I do. I think I answered that question okay, but there's, there's a lot more to chat about, but I think some of the other questions will get at it. That's great, thank you. So the second question is, what sparked your interest in the STEM fields and inspired you to pursue a career in astrophysics? So yeah. there's also an attendee question, oh, sorry. No, no, no. Um, What's the most exciting part? Um, awesome. So let me, I'll answer that part second. The first one is a little bit easier, actually. Um, so I, when I was growing up, um, the space shuttles were launching. And I remember, I'm not sure how old I was, but I was pretty young and I saw a space shuttle launch on TV. And that's sort of like my mind exploded. And I'm like, I'm going to do that. Um, and so I actually, when I have students who don't know what they want to do, I have trouble empathizing there because I've always wanted to do astro of some sort. And then at some point, probably um, in high school, I somehow realized that like being an astronaut just wasn't going to happen. You know, like it's hard to, to do that. And so um, somehow I figured out that astronomy, astrophysics would let you go to really cool places. Um, and so I love the physics, but also knowing that the physics would let me go to like cool places like um, the telescopes in Chile and in Hawaii and some other really amazing places. And so it was kind of the combination of being able to go awesome places and being do, being able to do physics like at the same time. 
um, that uh, sparked me to do this. And so I have always wanted to do astro. Um, and in high school, I realized that I could get better scholarships to go to college doing like engineering and physics. Um, but I knew that that was basically astro. And so um, uh, through undergrad, I was mostly doing physics um, and then into graduate schools when I started doing just astronomy. Um, what is the most exciting uh, thing about now that I'm researching? Um, I'm really excited. I just saw, I found it's, it, you'd think that every day you find like a new discovery and that's actually not true. Um, but today actually was one of those days. Um, so this morning I was preparing, before I was preparing for class, I was doing some of the work on this project that I have called the Saga Project. Um, the Saga Project, it stands for satellites around galactic analogs. And so we're studying small galaxies around bigger galaxies that are kind of like the Milky Way. So we're trying to understand how weird or how normal is our Milky Way galaxy by studying a bunch of other galaxies that are kind of like the Milky Way. Um, and uh, this morning, I we have now 100 galaxies that are kind of like the Milky Way. Um, and I realized that some of our things that we think are like the Milky Way um, are actually a little bit more isolated. They're more by themselves. They don't have as many neighbors around them. And those seem to be different than our Milky Way, which has a couple of nearby neighbors. Um, and so I was able to do some plots and figure a, a thing out. And it's really cool to, um, to discover something. And for the first couple hours, you're the only person that knows about it. Um, and it's it was really exciting. Now, I always assume that it's wrong somehow and I've screwed it up in some way. And so you go have to talk to a whole bunch of other people before you believe it. Um, but yeah, I really do. It's fun to to find something and think for a minute that maybe maybe you're the only person in the universe that knows that. And maybe make a difference to the yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. And like really understand. And this is a, an interesting project because it's you know, it's the Milky Way, it's where we live, it's where, it's our galaxy. And so kind of it, it becomes origins of like, where are we and, and who we are. Um, and so it kind of speaks to that as well. Um, what is one of the most memorable experience throughout your research or teaching career? Ah, that's a good one. I should have thought about this one a little bit more. Um, let's see. It really is fun. Um, so you guys are in classes right now and probably taking math classes and physics classes and that kind of thing. And it's a weird thing what we do in education, right? So you have problems that you have to solve and those problems have right answers, right? There's a right answer and, and you're hoping that you get the right answer, right? And you're worried that you get the wrong answer. And yet you're, many of you are studying for a career in research where not only isn't there a right answer, we don't even know what questions to ask. And so I think some of the most memorable teaching experiences have been showing students that, uh, giving them an experience that is like real research, right? When it's you coming up with the questions, let alone the answers. And for some people, I kind of think of it as my engineers versus the scientists. Right, and, and both are awesome. Engineers tend to like being given problems and trying to solve them. Like they're the problem solvers, the puzzle solvers. And then they're the scientists who are really excited about coming up with those questions. And much of our education system is geared towards the engineers. And so I really enjoy teaching when the scientists all of a sudden realize who they are. Um, and they realize that you really they really like coming up with the problems as well. And so those have been some of the most enjoyable teaching experiences that I have is is showing students how research works. And it's a slow process, but showing them sort of the spark of being able to come up with your own questions. I agree. And then the the handy question is what what makes the student body at Yale special? So, you know, it's not special. It's it's the same in many different places. Um, that said, you know, it is really fun to be in an environment where many, not all, but many of the students are just super passionate about what they're doing and very excited to learn. 
Um, and so um, it really is fun to teach in an environment where people are excited. And honestly, like it's it's not a magical place. It might seem like it, but it's it has all of some similar problems as a lot of other places. But in general, the student body is really um, passionate about learning and tries really hard to, um, you know, works really hard to to make it happen and to to learn. And so that's very gratifying as a professor. That is amazing. So our next question is, what is your favorite part of studying and working in STEM? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I'll answer it in two ways um, from a sort of a very personal thing. Like my favorite, if you ask me what I wanna do, um, I love just going into like a really quiet place and turning on like loud music and coding and just writing a bunch of Python code to do research. Um, I, I really love being able to like write a piece of code that does something awesome. Um, so that's kind of my favorite part, but that's, I don't think quite the, what the question is asking necessarily. Um, part of the, what I really like about my job and being a professor is that I can find a cool question and just, um, study it. And so, you know, if my research goes in one direction or another direction, I have the freedom to be able to do that and to put my time and energy into solving a question and coming up with that question. And there's nobody telling me what to do in terms of like what research and what science to do. And that's really cool. And um, I, I'm really kind of grateful for being able to, to have that freedom. That's great. So now for the general questions about your career paths and advice. What does your typical day look like? Good, yeah. Um, so my typical day, um, I have a couple different kinds of typical days. Um, my favorite typical days um, are really just taking, you know, my laptop and um, going somewhere quiet and, again, mostly coding. Um, and so much of physics, astrophysics for sure, is um, is writing code and, and, and that sort of thing. And so a really good day is just sitting on my laptop and working. Um, a less typical day, maybe three or four days, three or four days every six months. So like a semester, like um, I get about 10 nights of time on telescopes per year or so. And so an atypical day, but something that I do have to do and I enjoy a lot um, are the nights that we have telescope time. Um, and so that is, uh, at least for the last couple of years has been done remotely. So we will, you know, we'll log into a telescope again from a, a laptop. Um, there's someone, a person at a telescope. So one of the telescopes we're using, actually what day is this, Friday. Um, uh, we have a telescope night on Sunday in California at the Palomar Telescope. So Palomar is a five meter telescope. Um, we have three nights, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday night um, to actually work on this project that I was just talking about. Um, we're gonna be studying galaxies like the Milky Way. Um, and so there, uh, you know, you try and sleep in as late as you can. Um, and then you log into the telescope around like kind of five or 6 p.m. California time. Um, for for me, that'll be at, a, at, you know, like after many people are going like at 9 p.m. or so. And then um, we will do calibrations before the sun goes down. So calibrations are things like um, understanding what the camera is and uh, taking different calibrations in order to be able to understand our, our science data. And then we stay up from the time that the sun goes down until the sun rises. Um, do again some calibrations and go to sleep at, you know, 6, 7 a.m. Um, and we'll do wow. that for three three days in a row and then join the, re the world again and get back on the other schedule. Um, and so those are enjoyable. I, I like those kind of days. Is it difficult to go from sleeping <laughs> yeah. at 3, 6 a.m. and then all of a sudden back to a normal sleep schedule? Um, when I was your age, it was super easy. And now it's not... You know, I, I forget like, yeah, it's hard, but it's not the worst. 
Um, and when you're getting great data, it's really exciting. And so you just do it. That's interesting. So the next question is, what advice would you give to high school students who are considering a career in STEM fields? Awesome. And yeah. a transition from high school to college, choosing a major, what should our main focus be in high school? Excellent, excellent. Um, that's, those are all great questions. So um, my recommendation as in, in high school is, you know, really, you know, it, concentrating on the math and physics classes um, and like really understanding those, you know, doing things like, you know, if you have a teacher who you think is eh, um, getting online and finding um, YouTube videos and like the number of resources on for math and physics um, is amazing. And like taking, uh, you know, when there's a lot of free online classes in the subject that you're taking. So like if it's calculus, there's a lot of cool explainer videos on calculus and like really understanding the things that you're being taught. Um, I can't emphasize enough learning how to code. Um, the language of choice in most of the natural sciences currently, and probably for the next five years at least, if not longer, is Python. Um, so tons of resources online learning how to code in Python um, and becoming kind of a, you know, if you already know how to code, becoming a, a better coder. There's no such thing as the best coder. Like you can always learn. Um, and, and so learning how to code, and that really is across all of the sciences. And then transitioning into college, you know, as you um, as you become a first year in college, it really is very self motivated. And as you get to college, there's a lot less. There's no many fewer people looking after you. Um, and so being, you know, knowing how to be self directed, time management is what I hear from my college students a lot. They're always like, I am. It's time management is really difficult. And so learning how to know. You know, when is it enough for you? When do you need to sleep? Sleep is like really important. What do you need to make yourself happy? Um, that's something that in order to do good science, you need to be in a good place. You need to, um, you know, not be so stressed out that you're not sleeping and those sort of things. That doesn't do, that doesn't give you, doesn't make you a better scientist. And so learning how to take care of your own self is really important as well. Um, choosing a major doesn't matter. I mean, in some sense, it really doesn't matter at all. Um, you know, if you're doing science, whether you do physics or geophysics or engineering or any of those things, in some sense, as long as you're getting sort of all the basics, you're going to be fine. Um, and it, you know, it, it, you, I wouldn't recommend like majoring in English if you really want to go to physics graduate school, but there's a lot of room in between. Um, uh, and, and many, many paths that you might not think of. So for example, a lot of my students um, who major in astrophysics in college, um, maybe think that they're gonna go on and do graduate school and PhD and, and, and become a professor, but only maybe about half of them do that or even less. And the other half do amazing things. So I have many students who are graduating college now and going into space startups. Um, that is like a booming business at a moment. There's a lot of independent com companies that are launching satellites that are developing um, technology to do space debris removal and all these like crazy things. And having a degree in physics or in astrophysics sets you up for some of these really cool um, things. Another uh, interesting path you might not even think of is a lot of my students who do physics um, or astrophysics in college, you can go to law school or med school and you kind of stand out because like who is applying to law school that did astrophysics? There aren't that many. Um, and so in fact, it, it seems like you're walking a very narrow path, but these um, particularly STEM fields allow you to do tons of stuff and you don't need to make those decisions or it might feel like you're making a decision and you're closing doors, but actually you're not closing any doors. Thank you, that's great advice. What kind of student would you think would be a good fit for studying astrophysics and how can one start working in good. astrophysics? You know, a good fit is someone that is passionate and wants to do it. Um, you know, I, it's, it's the sort of thing you really want to do. 
Um, how to start working in it again, oddly enough, it really is coding. Um, we have a, um, a first year class when students get to college, and largely that is a coding class so that you can get into a research group. Um, doing, you know, I have actually started to see more high school students that are actually able to get a research experience. Um, before, even just a few years ago, that was unheard of. I, I, research is unheard of in high school, but it's becoming more and more a couple. It's becoming rare. It's still rare, but some people do it. Um, but to prepare yourself for um, doing research in astrophysics, it really is Python um, and learning sort of how to, you know, read files in and read data in and manipulate data and, and asking questions of of what you have. And so. Um, yeah, I, I think really just kind of the coding side is, is the way to get prepared. Um, and there also, there's a bunch of cool online classes that are free that do a lot of astrophysics. Um, I can send you some links or I can put some in the chat later. Um, places like, uh, Coursera, um, and edX, and there's a few others. If you Google those, they're free classes. Um, and they're like college classes in astrophysics or college classes in in first year physics. Um, those are kind of some of them are really good um, to 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 check out. Same thing for Python. I think Jessica will help us try to figure it out. Awesome. Oh, that's good. That's great. We'll try to put it in the chat in a bit. Awesome. Okay. So these are some of our attendee questions from our registration forms. And if you have any questions, you can leave them in the chat. The first question is, what opportunities arise for a woman who wants to study astronomy? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I am teaching an undergrad astrophysics class right now. It's called um, Scientific Computing for in Astrophysics. It's for juniors and seniors, uh, undergrads at Yale. Um, there are 13 students and there are 10 women in the class. Um, so majority women. Um, and that was actually true when I taught the, cl the class last year. Um, our graduate, we just finished graduate admissions for our graduate program. So that's students studying for PhD. And again, it was actually majority women. Um, and so that's not true across the board. And certainly, um, you know, historically and, on, you know, up until even just a few years ago, um, you know, certainly uh, challenges. Um, but I think that it is becoming more equitable, particularly in astronomy, like in, in physics and some of the other um, sciences, it still is. And depending on where you are, it can still be a challenge. Um, but there are great role models out there um, to, you know, and it can be done. You know, in my own experience, um, yeah, there are definitely people um, who are total jerks uh, and you have to sort of figure out how to deal with that. Um, but for the most part, I have felt welcome um, and uh, hope that I can do that for other people and help other people um, to feel welcome in the community. That's great. Um, our second attendee question is, what is your view on red matter? Do you think it is possible to exist naturally in our world? So I'm not sure what that, so I don't know what red matter means. And I'm wondering if the question is actually dark matter. Um, so I will answer the question uh, on, on dark matter. Um, so dark matter is something that we think is probably something like 80 or 90% of all of the mass in the universe. And um, if we look at galaxies, um, we infer from the gravity that something like 90% of the mass um, is, we see what we see is only about 10% of the mass that we infer from the gravity. And so um, we try a lot of different things, like what could this be? Could it be a bunch of golf balls? You know, well, so golf balls, you know, would block our view of certain things. And so it can't be golf balls and we would see them in other wavelengths. And so we go through all these different ideas of what it could be. And almost all ideas that where dark matter is like proton or neutron or electron sort of normal matter doesn't work. It, it just, it, we would be able to get rid of it in some way. The 
Best idea for dark matter right now is a particle that has the mass of a proton, but doesn't interact um, like a proton. It only interacts via gravity and maybe the weak force or something like that, but whatever. Just we'll just say gravity. Um, and what's really interesting is that the amount of these particles to explain the way we see galaxies move is the same amount that we need to also explain another observation of how much hydrogen and helium is in the universe. And so because it explains two different unrelated problems, doesn't mean it's right, um, but that's currently the best idea is that dark matter is a particle that is something like a proton, um, but doesn't interact like a proton. And that would mean that dark matter is streaming through the room that you're in, um, there'd be about 100,000 particles coming through the room at any one time. The problem is that, that because these things only interact gravitationally, they don't care about us at all. Um, so they're actually quite difficult to detect. There are experiments that are trying to actually directly detect dark matter, but so far we haven't um, had any positive results so far. Um, but that's a fun thing to, to explore a little bit more. So there's a couple of questions in the chat already. Can I ask, the, can I know. answer the last, yep, I can I answer the last one first. So have I used yes, James Webb Space Telescope? The answer there is yes, definitely. Um, so I am on what's called an early data release or early release science team. Um, we actually got the first science data off of the telescope last July and um, uh, we have been working on the, the data ever since, and so the data that we have from James Webb is uh, looking at individual stars in galaxies, small galaxies, satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. Um, and actually, if I, um, let's see if I can quickly find a link. There was a, a, a TV special, actually, and I am uh, in it for a, uh, just a second. It's like not, definitely not about me at all. Um, but it's kind of fun to watch and it's a it's a great uh I don't want to sign up what is this just a second oh well anyway I'll put it in the chat in a sec um it goes through some of the cool early data um from the James Webb Space Telescope ah here it is I got it um I think if you go to like number or uh, minute 37 or second i'm i'm in it but um it does go through some of the early james webb da data and it's really beautiful and some uh, lots of friends are actually in that in that special um let's see another question was uh tell us more about research um and what we're working on right now um oh and uh published work yeah for sure um so my work is actually in two different um, big projects. One I already talked about is looking at other Milky Ways um, and studying those. And the other half of my work is studying in great detail the small galaxies around our Milky Way. And so in the last um, 10 years, we've found many new small satellites around the Milky Way. Um, in like 2010, we only knew of 11 galaxies around the Milky Way. Um, and now we know of something like 60. And in fact, there probably are about 200 galaxies around our Milky Way, small galaxies that orbit around. Um, just the number of those things tells us something actually about the nature of dark matter. And these small galaxies are really useful in just studying how galaxies form. They're kind of the extreme. They're super, super faint. And so we can understand a little bit better about how galaxies form and evolve. Um, and so some of that James Webb data is helping us understand the ages and the chemical compositions of stars in these satellites around the Milky Way. Um, places to go read. So actually all of the papers that we write and publish are open access um, and, and you can read them for free. Um, there's a website called AstroPH. Let's see if I can um, find a link. Astro PH. Ah, good. Here's a link. Um, so I will put this link in the in the in the chat. It's both a paper, a review paper, actually, that um, 
I we wrote about two years ago that um, summarizes some of the evidence for dark matter. But also that website um, is the place where you can go and find all of the astro astronomy papers uh, for free. Um, and so you don't have, there's no sort of um, firewall, there's no, no nothing, it's all uh, open access. Um, and so hopefully that is kind of an interesting place to, to poke around and, and look at stuff. Let's see, so in the context of coding and astronomy, there are a lot of resources. Um, uh, what would it do astronomy and coding at the same time? Awesome. Uh, so I will put a, another link in the chat. So the class that I noted that I was teaching, um, the last time we taught it was entirely online. Um, and so this is the class that I'm teaching right now, although the, the um, this GitHub page is from the last time we taught it. And there are both lectures and um, homework sets and the solutions to those homework sets. Now, this is not, if you've never coded before, this is gonna be a higher level than um, where you are. But if you've done some coding, this takes it to the next level. Um, and so it might be an interesting resources um, for some people who have done some coding, but really want to um, take a look at it in the context of astronomy. Cool. Um, let's see. Another good question is about AI and um, the future. So this question has been asked a lot recently. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about chat GBT, particularly in the context of like, Oh, are students going to cheat and stuff on homeworks? I think ChatGPT is awesome. I love it. Um, and the reason I love it is because for coding, it's amazing. Um, so if there's a line of Python code that I don't understand, you just give it to ChatGPT and it'll explain it like really quickly. Um, if you have code that you think is not written well, you can ask ChatGPT to code better. Like, and 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 it's it's usually like 80% right, like so it's never 100% right, um, but it kind of helps you get closer to the right answer. Um, and so it's been really useful in that context. Um, I, you know, there are interesting ways that AI can help do things like classify galaxies and do those sort of things. Um, where I don't see AI really changing is, is you know, I want to understand how a galaxy forms and you can write like a code that, um, you know, does something, but you don't understand why it does it. And so I don't think that AI is really going to change the way we do things anytime super soon um, because it, it doesn't have a good way of, it does things well, but it doesn't explain why it's doing things well. Um, we'll see it, things are changing. And they're changing fast, but at the moment, I don't see um, machine learning and AI, which are different. But most of what we're doing right now is machine learning. Uh, it's it's really good in certain problems, but it's not good for all problems. Um, let's see. What? Ah, uh, why are we looking for dark? Let's see. So. Um, I think I'll answer this question in my own way. So why are we looking for dark matter or dark energy? So dark matter and dark energy are different. I usually just work on dark matter. Dark energy is at larger scales than let's say the Milky Way. Um, it's operating on, on larger scales than usually what I study. Um, and you know, you could ask sort of why are we doing astronomy? That's an interesting question. Like, you know, why we've got tons of problems here on earth right like we have a lot of things we need to solve why are we doing astronomy and i think i have two questions answers for that um one is that you know i'm a huge strong supporter of sort of pure research something that is not obviously going to be monetized tomorrow or is obviously going to solve a problem tomorrow um one of the best examples of pure research that is paid off. Um, when Einstein first proposed general relativity, so this is in like 1918, you know, it had no practical use. And not only does it had it had no practical use for 50, 60 years, 
you now use general relativity every single day and you may not even know it. So when you use GPS, that is, you know, you use your phone to try and like figure out how to get to the store or to somebody's house. When you're using um, that app, you're actually using general relativity. Um, the satellite, so you're basically connecting to satellites that are um, in orbit around the Earth, and they are in a slightly different gravitational field. And without general relativity, you would be lost within 10 minutes. And so that's an amazing place where, you know, general relativity, when Einstein first proposed it, was just an astrophysics thing, totally impractical. And for 50 years, it was totally impractical. And now the entire world, every day, depends on it. Okay, so that's an amazing, like crazy example. But, you know, like there's a lot of smaller versions of that all over the place. And so I really do think that pure research that doesn't obviously have, you know, some monetizing way is really important. But I also think that astronomy in general, you know, if we aren't asking questions of where we come from and, and asking those big questions, kind of, you know, it's not very much fun to do all the other things either. It's sort of inspiring. And if you're not inspired, um, it kind of seems like it's not a, it's not a fun way to live. Let's Another see. question from Shale. Uh, Alexi, how do we come up with creative questions during research? Ah, that's a fantastic question. And I'm not sure I have a great answer. Um, to be honest, my day to day, I am not asking creative questions. I'm trying, you know, like I have this problem and I have to solve this problem and I wouldn't call it creative. Um, I would say that, um, you know, I have only come up with creative questions, like really sort of innovative new things, you know, once a year, once every few years, it's a rare thing. It's a beautiful thing, but it's a rare thing. Um, and that's the sort of thing where like, you've done all this research, you've done all these things, you, you don't know what to do. And you go like on a walk, you know, you take a shower or, you know, you go, I don't know, you know, it's like. It's one of those things where it's the same way that you'd have to get that inspiration when you do art or any other thing. Like it's hard to explain what you do, but you kind of let your mind wander. Um, you know, I often, you know, as I'm going to sleep, I'll think about research problems or if I'm going out and taking a hike, I'll think about them. And sometimes when you're kind of not staring at it straight in the face is when you come up with the most creative um, questions to ask. But it's a, the, your, your question is excellent in the sense of it's coming up with creative questions not necessarily creative answers. Um, and that's awesome. And you will it, you will have to learn how to do that your whole life and you'll never figure it out fully. And that's kind of the beauty of it all. Thank you. Sure. I think there is one more question before that. Uh, it was from Shale. What has um, been a few of your favorite discoveries through your research so far? Oh, cool. Okay. Um, let's see. What have been my favorites? Um, ah, my most favorite. Most favorite right now is, um, so we have, we look at galaxies all over the place and we can kind of classify galaxies as those that are currently actively forming stars and those that are quenched, that are, are not forming stars. Um, and uh, we kind of see in the universe, if you look at galaxies, kind of half-half. So things that are not forming stars tend to be redder in color, um, a smoother. Things that are forming stars are kind of more lumpy, they're bluer, and you can actually often see regions where new stars are being born. And we think that um, we're trying to understand the processes that um, stop star formation, that is a galaxy might be forming stars and maybe it runs out of the material to form stars. So it, it runs out of the gas that stars are made out of, and then it stops forming stars. Or let's say a galaxy is forming stars and it comes into some environment that um, quenches or pulls the star gas out of the galaxy or does something. And so it, it's quenched because it's in some very dense environment. And so one of the um, results that we found a couple of years ago is that galaxies at a certain mass scale, so a little bit smaller than the Milky Way, um, if they're by themselves, they just simply bubble and form stars all the time. That is, we've never found a galaxy 
that is less massive than about a tenth the Milky Way that is not forming stars. So a galaxy that's forming stars at, at low mass is constantly bubbling and can't quench itself. And so it will always be able to more, make stars. And that I'm not explaining that very well at all. Um, but it was an interesting thing that it, it was sort of a boundary condition on the processes that govern star formation. Um, and that was a, a, a particularly clean result. Usually in astro, it's a it's a bit me more messy. You kind of find something, but you're not quite sure. And this one was like a definitive galaxies less massive than this threshold are always forming stars. And that was kind of a cool result. I'm going to totally stop there because I can't, I, maybe it's too late or something. It's on a Friday night. Um, <laughs> let's see. Oh, thank you for saving me. So what are other career paths in STEM um, that I seriously considered pursuing? Oh, that's a good question. If I had many lives, I would definitely do geology. I think genetics is really cool. Tons of other stuff. Um, this life, I, I'm going to keep doing astro because it's really fun. Um, that said, uh, you know, I honestly find almost any of the STEM fields really interesting. Um, and there are cool problems all over the place. And so maybe like kind of coming back to when I said it really doesn't matter what major that you choose in college. Um, I do think that like if you have a good background in math and physics and coding, almost any problem in any STEM field is awesome. And so although it feels like you have to choose something, you know, and, and find your path, I think there are many multiple paths that could be just as amazing. Um, and that, you know, it feels maybe like you're closing doors if you decide that you're going to do physics and not something else. But in fact, um, there's so many amazing, cool things to do in STEM that you, you almost have a bunch of choices and they're all good ones. That's great. Um, if there's no more questions, we would like to say a big thank you. We all just say a big thank you to Professor Giha for her time and for the links and resources that she gave us. Those are really helpful. And thank you so much for your time. Awesome. And thank you, thank so you much guys. For Good luck to all of you on your path. You're going to be fine. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye. Thank you.